Thank you. So I feel bad because the previous speakers kept right on time, and I'm planning to go way over time because I, I have a lot that I want to get out. And I know it smells really good, and I'm keeping you between the food and the, and the drinks. Um, but I'm last, so that's what there is. Um, I, I really appreciate coming after. I'm going to repeat a lot of what was said just to get a sense of, of the room. Who here is a water scientist? Their trainings in water sciences? Who here is a water policy person? Who here is neither and just walked in for the view and got stuck here? Okay, this whole group. This is who I'm going to speak to, exactly right. So, and I appreciate the kind introduction. I, I'm actually a visiting scholar at UNESCO IHE uh, in Delft. Uh, so I'm here in Europe for as long as I can be. Um, the, uh, the, the problematique, if you will, has already been laid out. Uh, basins there, we count 310 transboundary basins, basins that are shared by two or more countries. And when we started doing this work, now I started in the, in the mid-1990s, people were talking about six basins, and they were saying that the wars of the 21st century were going to be about water, and they were pointing to this, these six basins over and over and over. And my initial training is as a scientist, so I asked what scientists ask. I said, how do you know? What are the assumptions? These six basins, always the same, the Nile, the Tigris, Euphrates, the Aral, the Jordan, these same basins, when you really dig into their histories, as Thomas already mentioned, have rich histories also of cooperation. Sure, there were tensions, and that gets the headlines, but real rich histories of cooperation. And most of them actually had come to treaties that turn out to be really resilient over time, even as they fight over other, other issues. So these six were not at all uh, um, emblematic of the problem of transboundaries. So we did what scientists do. We compiled stuff and we counted them. And, and Thomas already uh, alluded to this. We created what's now the Transboundary Freshwater Dispute Database. We compiled all the treaties that we could find, the events of, of between two countries, indigenous methods of conflict resolution. We made a map of all the world's transboundary basins because it didn't exist before. We started to measure events exactly as, as Thomas described along the spectrum from conflict to cooperation because at the time in the, in the academic and popular presses, nobody was looking at cooperation at all, which seemed like a tremendous oversight. We ended up looking back trying to find as many interactions between two countries as we could over a 60-year period over water and coding it along that spectrum from intense conflict to intense cooperation. And Thomas already mentioned the outcome of this. This one graph is probably the, the, the most um, uh, cited uh, piece of work, certainly, that I've ever done. We just put the, the events along this spectrum to find quantitatively, that two-thirds of the time we do anything over water, it's cooperate. And these are the same countries that people were pointing to as conflictive. These are Arabs and Israelis, Indians and Pakistanis, Azeris and Armenians. All over the world, people cooperate often when they won't cooperate over other things. On the left-hand side, that co conflict uh, uh, spectrum, 80% of co conflict is verbal conflict. As we said, politicians love to say, we're going to go to war over water. Journalists love to write, they're going to go to war over water. And the, the, the water people, in the meantime, quietly resolve the issue and go back to the treaties that they have and resolve the issues. On the violent conflict, there's very little, just as Thomas said, 28 cases over a 60-year period. 27 of them were between Israelis and Arabs. And what's interesting is the last shot fired between them over water was in 1970. So this shows us, and the basin is entirely out of water, has been for, for 30 years, which shows us even as populations grow, even as economies grow, even as the, the water situation gets more and more dire, they've resolved their issues in the absence of violence, often with political stress, but very little violence. So at some point, a group came to us, a, a security-minded group, and they said, OK, we get that there's not war and there's not a lot of violence, but there's tremendous political stresses over water. Can you help us predict? Can you find indicators that will indicate the next round of water stress? And here's the catch. 
you have to show that your indicators have indicated something in the past. Well, fortunately, we had these 1,800 events. So we sat around and we thought about what any group would think about when they're thinking about what would indicate water tension. Water stresses and population growth and economic growth and so on and so forth. And we put all of these into the tool that we have in geography, a geographic information system. It was 100 layers of data, but the data changes every year. So it was 60 years of 100 layers. Never want to work with data again. Once, what's nice about this, well, what's frustrating about this, the data changes. In the middle of our study period, the Soviet Union broke apart, which was tremendously frustrating to me personally, I have to say. All of these basins are new transboundary basins that resulted simply of the breakup of the Soviet Union. So even our base map changed. But what's nice about having all the data in one place, all you have to do is push the button and out will pop the indicators. So after two and a half years of collecting data, we pushed the button and out came absolute garbage. It didn't matter what indicator we were looking at. Statistically, nothing indicates anything about anything anywhere. Full stop. What do you do with that? Well, we went back and looked and it was tremendously frustrating. Here, for example, is government type. You can make some assumptions about government type. On the right-hand side is the conflict level of ardent democracies. On the left-hand side is the conflict level of fascist dictatorships. Absolutely identical. We had all assumed that water stress was one of the things that drives conflict. It's it just natural. It's innate that you assume that. So we looked at climate types. And here, the long lines are better. The long, these are different climate types. And the, the long lines are better. The short lines are the, are the uh, conflictive, um, uh, more conflictive climate types. And sure enough, the dry climate turns out to be the more cooperative. So here's where the light bulb went off. This is exactly, and I see in your eyes, I can, I can see you, you, you nodding. This is where our light bulb went off, that it's not just about stress. Along with all of the stress comes the institutional capacity to deal with stress. And of course the dry climate is the most cooperative, because dry climates force people to get together to build institutions to deal with their dry climate. Now it makes sense. Now I'm stuck because I, I'm told I have to hold the microphone like this, but I, need, I talk with two hands. You have what the change in the basin, and you have the institutional capacity that absorbs the change. And we have to measure those together. You can have wild fluctuations between, for example, US and Canada. Any Canadians here? We will never, ever go to war with Canada over water. You can quote me on that, ever, ever. We love Canada. We have great agreements. We have a long history of cooperation. The same variation in two states that don't have the agreements and don't have the history and don't have the, the relations, it could be more conflictive. So how do you do that? Here's an example. This is dam density in different basins. And statistically, that top level, the top line is, dam is basins with uh, low dam density and basins with high dam density. There's no statistical uh, significance between them. The next, set of, the next pair are basins with agreements, high dam density and low dam density. And you notice the overall level is more cooperative and the difference between them almost doesn't exist. In contrast, the third set of bars is basins with, high dam, with no, uh, no treaties high dam density and low dam density. The point is it's not the dams that cause the conflict, it's the dams in the absence of a treaty about what to do about the dam. And this, fortunately, is exactly something that we can measure. So we go back and we look at our, our assumptions. Now we understand that there are two sides to the relationship. The likelihood of conflict rises as the rate of change within a basin exceeds the institutional capacity. Two sides to the equation, and how do we monitor? One, we look at change in a basin. What's the physical change? Or is somebody want to build something? That's the most biggest indicator of potential problems. Somebody wants to build something. But then we compare it to what's the relationship between the treaties? What are their GDPs? How, what kind of treaties do they have? What kind of relationships do they have? All of this stuff is monitorable. And on the other side, the other thing that, that uh, the fastest change on the institutional side are basins that break into many countries. 
So this also can be, can be monitored, and here's how we do it. First of all, we look at the institutional capacity. What do different pairs of, in a basin have in terms of treaties, river basin organization relations? We then put dams onto the map, and we look in areas where people want to build dams. And remember, with a tender, we can actually predict a dam three to five years out. Where do people want to build dams, and there's no agreement about what to do on the dams? The other side, countries breaking apart, is also something you can monitor. This is the history of conflict and cooperation divided into thirds. The first third on the left is immediately post-World War II as the, uh, the British Empire primarily broke apart. And you think about where the tensest basins are in the, in the world today, a lot of times it's a former British Empire. Or then there was a stable period during the Cold War and then a more conflictive period after the Cold War, the breakup of the Soviet Union. So these are countries that developed relations when they were one country and then uh, became several countries. This is also something we can monitor. There's a, there's a regular uh, count of independence movements, how successful they're likely to be. So you would look at places, formerly you would look at a South Sudan, or currently you'd look at a Kurdistan. You'd look in places with independence movements where there will suddenly be new states. So this is what we did now in 2003. We put this together and developed what we call basins at risk. This is the map that we generated. This is the map the way the United Nations published it. Can anybody see the difference? Where's our cartographers? What's the difference? So what we did, look at the color scheme first of all. This is a stoplight color scheme. The UN said, no, 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 that's too conflictive. We're going to go with a grapevine color scheme. We don't like the reds and the, we don't have conflict in the UN system. This was our title for our study. This was the UN title for their study, right? Maps are political, right? Anyway, this is what we've been doing. And every year, we've been doing the same thing. We try and generate a, a basins at risk map regularly so we can keep uh, track. We've done this now three times uh, globally. Uh, the same general relation, looking at the, the rate of change and the institutional capacity once. Uh, with the, uh, at the basins at risk whenever we can, once with the World Bank in 2010, and once with the Transboundary Water Assessment Program in 2015, each time using the same set of relations, but each time the data is getting better and better. And so that's where I want to end with a proposal. You've heard a number of different um, approaches to this thing. We think there is a clear methodology to do early warning at the global scale. And I want to come back to your point. This is only at the global scale. To get at the irrational side, we, we have to zoom in and talk to the people who are involved. There's no question. But what we're hoping is that we need to continuously update these data sets, which is surprisingly uh, uh, hard to, to, uh, to do, but we have, we have not only the capacity, but we have the methodology clear um, that our database, that Thomas's database could be merged, could be normalized. Um, this ge geovisualization comes from this team here, uh, Simonet and, and Denisov, both, both who, who designed a, a water atlas for the uh, SDC um, using the same conceptual framework, but not the same data. And we were talking today, and we think we can use this beautiful geovisualization, but back it up with the solid data uh, that we have. And then this gives us a global map, and then you zoom in locally, doing the kinds of things that, uh, that Christian and his team uh, would like to do, social network analysis and, con and con uh, content analysis. So we, we think this is possible and would be useful. To come to your question, ma'am, we think, we're hopeful that political people would pay attention. We're not 100% confident. I'm not saying anything about political people in general. I'm just saying sometimes a map, it takes more than a map to persuade people to do something. But people have been willing, especially the Swiss, the Dutch, the Swedes, have been willing to go into basins precisely to bolster the institutional capacity that is precisely what's needed to help prevent the next conflict. So as Kofi Annan said, oh, I didn't get his name up here. Let's just say I said it. It was actually Kofi Annan. The water problems of our world need not only be a cause of tension, they can be a catalyst for cooperation if we work together a secure and sustainable sustainable water future can be ours thank you